if an investor is looking at a real estate investment uh, and they've got a million dollar capital gain and it happens to be in an opportunity zone, so they plan to invest in this one way or another. The open question is, do I forego the OZ benefits, lock in the 20% capital gain rate, pay it today or on this return, or do I go ahead and take the OZ benefits? Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. Today, we have a guest in the Buzz House who is our partner, Mike Fitzpatrick, who is our Executive Vice President of Baker Tilly Capital, and we'll get into that uh, when we start talking with Mike. We're going to be talking with Mike today about opportunity zones, from how the market uh, is looking, what kind of opportunities uh, are out there, what, what, what is working in the market today. So looking forward to having that discussion. Before jumping in with Mike uh, about opportunity zones, just a, a few updates uh, around the industry. Garrick and I recently held a webinar discussion with representatives of National Equity Fund, U.S. Bank, RBC Capital Markets, and CREA to give an update on the loan composing tax credit equity market. You'll be able to find the full hour-long discussion on the Baker Tilly website, and we have a link posted here at our podcast site as well. There is a detailed discussion around underwriting changes and sensitivity analysis working on projects throughout the pandemic. There was also a discussion of what types of projects investors are looking for in the current market. And the general consensus was really to wait to go to the equity markets maybe until the new year, after we get through a few more months of the pandemic, get through the election and so forth. We will definitely plan to have another equity panel discussion sometime right around year end, December, January. So please stay tuned for that, uh, that webinar. On another note, in our last podcast, we noted that qualified census tracts and difficult to develop areas uh, were, were listed out for 2020-2021. Uh, they were issued by HUD. We wanted to mention that if you're looking at a tax-exempt bond deal that is located in a QCT or DDA here in 2020, and looking at the 2021 census tracts, the, pro- the project is no longer on the list, you can try and preserve that 30% basis boost by filing a complete application to your state allocating agency by December 31st, 2020. If you have any questions on that, please reach out to Garrick or myself. Finally, the House passed a scaled-down version of the HEROES Act down to $2.2 trillion from the original $3 million plus, $3 trillion plus package. This version does not include any provisions around the loan composing tax credit. It does, again, contain a few provisions around rental assistance where there's a lot of buzz in the market. Not a big chance of moving forward is what everyone is seeing. A few interesting things that are in this package, again, include additional stimulus checks for taxpayers with income below a certain level. And there's also um, looking at potentially what could be attached to a tax extender bill in December around improvements to loan closing tax credit program, especially the 4% fixed rate. So we'll keep our our eyes and ears on that as well. Now we're very excited to bring in uh, Mike Fitzpatrick, who is with Baker Tilly Capital. Mike, thanks again for, for joining us today. Would you Just give our listeners a little background of what your role and responsibilities are at Baker Tilly Capital. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me on, Don and Garrick. Um, I've been with Baker Tilly, it'll actually be 20 years at the end of this month. Uh, Time flies. Um, I'm a partner in our real estate advisory group where I lead our capital formation practice, which sources limited partner equity for real estate investments and developments. Uh, We specialize in opportunity zones, but we'll assist uh, with non-opportunity zone investments too. Um, prior to the OZ program, I've worked extensively on our new market tax credit practice and EB-5 practices. And before joining Baker Tilly, I was a commercial lender, um, principally focusing on uh, construction financing and uh, commercial real estate. So I've really spent my entire career on uh, real estate financing. Mike, thanks for that introduction. Uh, 20 years, that is a long time. <laughs> uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, move into a few questions so we can get started. Um, to start out, what type of products are attractive to investors in this particular market? Yeah, uh, Gary, as you can imagine, um, investor preferences have shifted quite a bit in the last six to seven months due to COVID. 
Um, you know, we see uh, really no appetite uh, for hospitality, retail, or office at the moment. Um, investors are really, you know, certainly kind of a visceral reaction to, um, you know, the slowdown in travel, uh, the work from home trend, um, you know, maybe a belief that work from home trend is not, you know, it's certainly going to be more than temporary. So it will put some, have some kind of negative impact on office space. And, um, you know, online and delivery services are booming. So, you know, retail is a concern. So really the demand's really focused on multifamily. Um, so I think there's still interest in real estate investing and getting into non-correlated real estate assets to diversify from the marketplace. Um, and that, the, you know, really the asset class of choice is shifting to the multifamily. And I'm seeing um, some mixed interest in student housing. Um, you know, I'm hearing a couple of different theories on student housing. One would be that um, universities are going to have to reduce the density in their dorms, and that will push kids off campus and require more private student housing, uh, you know, proximate to college campuses. But then, um, you know, the counter argument to that tends to be um, a lot of schools are pushing uh, distance learning uh, and focusing on distance learning in a lot of you know, college kids are thinking, well, why am I, why would I pay all this money uh, to, you know, learn online when I can find a, you know, much less expensive way to, to learn online. So I think the, you know, the, the jury's still a little bit out. Um, personally, I've got college age kids um, and I, I don't think there'll be any reduction in demand for uh, 18 year olds to leave the house and be in on their own. So I think that um, I, my bet would be on uh, student housing, uh, at private student housing actually being a, a strong growth area. Um, Another interesting trend is that um, institutional investors we talk with appear to be um, a lot more interested in what we used to call flyover country. Um, they, you know, institutional investors really liked focusing on coastal markets and being in top 10 metro markets. Um, not so much now. I think they're, they're showing a lot more interest and we've um, had institutional investors coming into projects in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and as well as uh, Green Bay. So. Um, I think we're finding that, um, you know, the institutional players are hedging their bets on um, maybe a shift from people leaving, you know, large uh, metropolitan areas. The other thing is we're seeing with uh, high net worth uh, individual investors, you know, their preference really tends to focus on markets they know, where they live, uh, maybe where they vacation, maybe where they grew up. Um, they tend to invest more on instinct and on projected returns than maybe what you'd call um, solid fundamentals. Good. That was a lot of really good, good information for our listeners, Mike. Mike, another uh, question we have for you is, what are some general underwriting benchmarks that sponsors might be aware of? You know, many of our listeners might have not done an OZ deal before, so this would be good to help them out, like general, general underwriting benchmarks. Yeah. Um, so about two years ago, when the program was starting to, you know, come together and people were getting a sense for what it could be, I think there were high expectations in the development community that there would be a, uh, a gush of uh, capital available for development and that uh, that um, that would push return expectations lower in order to get the tax benefits and uh, developers would have access to more affordable or less expensive capital. And that just has not happened at all. Even pre-COVID, it wasn't happening. Um, what we're finding is um, investors and I think it largely due to the fact that they don't have a full grasp on how to value the tax benefits when they analyze investment options that are in OZs versus those that are not in OZs. And so what we're seeing, even at the institutional level, an expectation of what I would call um, market rate of returns, uh, and then the OZ benefits are just kind of on top of that. Um, and so when it comes to underwriting real estate uh, developments and investments, we do it much like institutional investors do. Um, you know, we focus on numerous metrics, uh, such as untrended yield on cost relative to an exit cap rate, cost per unit, expected exit price, uh, selling price per uh, unit, uh, expense ratios, fees uh, that are ultimately paid to related parties, um, you know, the demand drivers of the market, the growth in the marketplace, uh, age of competition, uh, future competitive supply in the pipeline. And of course, the depth and experience of the development team and the, and the skin in the game that they have. So, you know, um, in, in, along with normal standard due diligence items like environmental review, status of plans and approvals, loan terms, et cetera. So, you know, each investment's unique. Um, but, you know, if I were to say from a general perspective, we like to, 
you know, come in around a more modest leverage point, 60, 65% uh, loan to cost so that the project has a little bit of breathing room uh, in case rent concessions are required to get, uh, to get the property leased up. But then, um, you know, once it's stabilization, going out to the secondary market for long-term fixed rate financing, you know, try and leverage up to a, a higher, uh, I mean, maybe I, maybe I should focus more on a, a suitable debt service coverage ratio of 1.2 or something like that. Uh, so we can do a cash out refinance for investors and help you know, enhance the IRR that way once we have a stabilized asset. Um, you know, we look for a kind of a 90-10 split uh, between the general partner and the limited partners on equity contribution and pro rata cash distributions uh, based on that from operations and typically um, a priority return of capital uh, to the limited partners from a refi or sale event. And then you know, we try to keep the waterfall structures relatively standard um, and, and easy to understand. Uh, typically, once we had a 12% IRR for the LPs, you know, like an 80-20 split with the developer and maybe going to 60-40 at a 14% IRR. So, you know, we're kind of finding that investors, because we always get the question, well, what, what kind of rate of return do investors need to see? And again, it kind of varies from market um, and, and perception of risk reward. But, you know, I would say we're, um, investors are generally not getting interested in anything that have uh, returns without opportunity zone benefits below a 13% IRR on a 10 year old. Awesome. So, you know, the question I have, uh, given all of the, the different types of underwriting benchmarks and, and the things to be aware of, obviously elections um, can play into a lot of what's going on and um, especially the equity markets. So as far as OZ equity is concerned, is this pending election uh, impacting any of the OZ equity that you're seeing in the market? Yeah, no question about it. Uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, the tax laws have been very, um, you know, favorable for the wealthy over the last few years. And, uh, you know, the Biden campaign is coming with some fairly strong messaging about, um, you know, increasing cap gain rates, um, maybe uh, reducing um, uh, asset exclusions on estates, um, maybe getting rid of basis adjustments, um, things like that. So there's a lot of investors who are very, you know, kind of skittish about what's happening or could happen uh, if there's a change in administration. And, and there's a lot of talk about you know, should they consider an OZ strategy or not? Should they just look at potentially triggering capital gain events uh, before the end of this calendar year in order to lock in 20% uh, cap gain rates, which I think is, it's fair to argue that, you know, cap gain rates probably wouldn't go lower even if, um, you know, the current administration stayed in place. So um, I think there's, you know, definitely a lot of impact that's happening um, on the election side of it or the, but, you know, the thing is, is I, that, that kind of goes back to my prior comment about not fully understanding the, the benefits of an opportunity zone investment and really demonstrating how an opportunity zone investment is a hedge against rising capital gain rates. And, and what we show in a nutshell in the article is that um, if an investor is looking at a real estate investment uh, and they've got a million dollar capital gain and, and their thought process, well, I like the real estate investment and it happens to be in an opportunity zone. So they plan to invest in this one way or another. The, the open question is, do I forego the OZ benefits, lock in the 20% capital gain rate, pay it today or on this return, or do I go ahead and take the OZ benefits? Um, you know, a lot of times the analysis um, in OZ investor land, if you will, has been, well, I'm choosing between two separate investments, one's in an OZ, one's not, but they're not, it's not necessarily comparing apples to apples. And that's a much more challenging analysis. The math is really straightforward when you're comparing the same investment and, and asking the question, do I take the OZ benefits or not? And, you know, under the assumption that capital gain rates double from 20 to 40%, um, the math is clear. Um, the after-tax cash flow from making an OZ election, in, in this example in, uh, in the article I'm writing, uh, is 30% greater because what happens is, is even though um, you forego locking in the 20% rate today and you pay 40% with a 10% basis discount, 
uh, in 2026. So that's $160,000 difference on a million dollar investment. However, what people often forget and don't add into that equation are the long-term benefits from OZ by holding that investment for the 10 year cycle and eliminating recapture of depreciation and eliminating the, fu the federal capital gain tax on that future OZ investment. And in this particular example, uh, that's about a $695,000 savings. So really the, the increase, um, you know, and that short-term increase uh, on that capital gain in 2026 is way more than offset uh, by the savings overall when you look at the combined OZ benefits on a 10-year holding period. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of good information. And um, I know you've, you've been touching a lot on, on you know, IRRs and, and values. And I think I think you might have cleared up a lot on, on some confusion, uh, how investors should look at OZ benefits. Any any other tidbits for investors when they're looking at an analysis uh, of factoring and OZ benefits? I, th I think one thing, especially if they're comparing, you know, um, an OZ and a non-OZ, and it's not a choice of whether or not I make the election, but um, I've got Project A and Project B to choose from, one's in an OZ. Uh, those tax benefits that I mentioned are substantial in terms of not having depreciation recaptured and, and avoiding the capital gain on the exit. Um, so much so that uh, it can allow an investor to look at, say, a project in an opportunity zone that maybe yields uh, 13, 14 percent, and maybe in comparison to a different project and not in an OZ that yields higher, something higher like 16, 17 percent, that on a net net on an after tax basis, they're going to be way better off taking the OZ investment. That'll more than make up for that difference in return. So I think that, um, and we have tools on our website that can help uh, investors make that assessment. We have an OZ calculator. Uh, on the Baker Tilly website that will allow investors to, to look at, you know, what rate of, re essentially it's, it helps them solve for what rate of return do I need on a non-OZ investment to be the equivalent after-tax cash return on an OZ investment. And they can even make um, adjustments to, uh, based on their view of future capital gain rates as well. And that will help them, um, you know, sort of assess those decisions. Perfect. So if, People have a large capital gain and they come to you and they say, Michael, I have a large capital gain. Uh, what are their options for getting into an investment? Well, I like to say they only have one option, which is to talk to us, but <laughs> you know, certainly <laughs> one option. Um, you know, so, you know, Baker Tilly Capital, we, we have uh, several opportunity zone offerings that are available. Um, we've got several more that are going through our diligence process right now. You know, I think our business model um, might be a good reason to take a hard look at what we're doing because we focus on what we call the single asset qualified opportunity fund. And that means it's one real estate asset inside of a qualified opportunity fund. It's not commingled with other real estate assets or any other asset for that matter. So, you know, what we offer is full transparency. It's not a blind fund or a partially blind fund. Uh, we focus on working with developers that are doing more of the type of work that made them successful. Uh, we're not working with upstarts and um, we're not working with developers that, you know, if you will, get out of their swim lane and, and do something that they're not accustomed to doing just because they think they're better off doing it because it's in an opportunity zone. Um, we also work with developers that are well healed, that basically carry all of the pre-development risk so that um, our clients are coming in when the project is shovel ready and they're taking what I would call pure limited partner risk of, you know, construction, lease up stabilization. Um, and, you know, so I would say that, you know, and we work on a, a waterfall structure that I call institutional in nature. So it's a very investor forward uh, type of process. Other sources for opportunities on investments, um, a number of registered investment advisors, independent broker dealers, I have access to them. I believe some have been offered through uh, crowdfunding platforms like CrowdStreet. Um, otherwise, a lot of it is just maybe through the internet and word of mouth. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. That was a lot of really good information. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll put some of those links to the OZ calculators and so forth on our podcast landing site. So we'll get those out for all of our listeners. Listeners, thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. 
And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com. <laughs>